generic podcast introduction. Pleasant introduction reinforced. More specific details, followed by an overwritten joke. Strained laughter. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So if you're one of the three people who know what the hell we're talking about, and and like two are in the room, (laughs) um, (laughs) you'll know that we've arrived at the Schizopolis portion of the season, uh, which is perhaps one of the most crucial films in Soderbergh's career. Uh, It's weirdly the movie that nobody wanted, but it was the one that Soderbergh needed. That's sadly accurate, and we're happy you're here to join us for another episode of The Filmographer's Podcast, the show where we study a director's entire career, one film at a time. I'm Kier Graff. And I'm Michael Morisi. We are interested in the big picture, and that's never been truer than today as we dig into this defining juncture in Steven Soderbergh's career. More is at stake than just the success of one film. Schizopolis, in my opinion, would come to be the turning point of the acclaimed director's life. Imminent sustenance. Overly dramatic statement regarding upcoming meal. Ooh, false reaction indicating hunger and excitement. <laughs> That's right. But this bear wears obligation. A hat. The bear wears the hat. Reading. Response indicating call and mistake. Semi-innocent query. <laughs> Convincingly confused. Here. <laughs> I love this. I'm so I've been so excited about this. Uh, Kier, <laughs> describe Schizopolis in just one sentence. <laughs> <clears throat> stalling. <laughs> I am stalling. This was this was a hard one. Working in a style that at times evokes the broad 1960s British comedies of his hero Richard Lester, Soderbergh plums his own psyche in a loose improvisational tale where the storylines of Fletcher Munson, speechwriter for the Scientological T. Azimuth Schwitters, Elmo Rocket, an action hero exterminator, and Dr. Jeffrey Korchak, Munson's doppelganger, culminate in an assassin... <laughs> An assassination scene that certainly didn't cause Oliver Stone to lose any sleep. <laughs> that was a really good, well done, Kier. Ah. Well done. <laughs> Schizopolis is just the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Um, yeah, I sweated that one. And obviously I sweated just trying to get it out of my mouth. <laughs> well, I mean, true to what you just said, there, there's just there's a lot to talk about with Schizopolis. The movie, around it. I mean, it, it's such a formative moment for Soderbergh, his career, his life. And I don't want to dig into like the making and the conditions around Schizopolis too early because because we'll we'll go off the rails. There's so much there. But like the movie does as a movie deserve to be discussed um, a lot. (laughs) (laughs) So far, you know, we've both been lukewarm, tepid on Soderbergh's movies so far. You know, nothing that we really dislike, but nothing we've been really wild about. Um, But if I'm not mistaken, you really like Schizopolis. Yes? (laughs) I did. I did like it. I want to slightly correct the the last thing you said. I did like Sex, Lies, and Videotape quite a bit. I thought it held up very well. Of the following films, yes, they're very hit and miss. But I liked Schizopolis. Um, I had been... Racking my brain as we approach this sort of thinking, like, have I seen that? Because it kind of felt like I had seen it, but I couldn't remember seeing it. And I thought surely I I would have remembered had I seen it. So uh, anyway, uh, the the appointed day came. I sat down to watch it. I was really afraid. I was terribly afraid because everything I knew about the movie was that it was going to reflect its title and that it's so experimental and you know what the hell's happening here Soderbergh's getting in front of the camera he's acting you know the only time he ever really acted um and it's 
a low budget, deeply personal film that was kind of made up on, on the spot. I just, I, my expectations were low. And yet I thought there was so much fresh about it. There were times I laughed out loud. It is undoubtedly kind of a challenging watch. And um, there are times when it's not the most aesthetically pleasing watch. I watched it with my 17 year old son, Cosmo, uh, who designed our amazing logo as well. And he loved it as well. He told, he wouldn't even sit down and watch the underneath with me. Um, but he loved Schizopolis. Um, we were laughing at different parts together as we referenced in the introduction of this podcast. One of the funniest scenes is when, uh, <laughs> the char character comes home. Um, uh, Fletcher Munson comes home and greets his wife, you know, like generic greeting. And, uh, it's sustenance imminent. <laughs> sustenance imminent. <laughs> oh, it was like a feigned interest or something. Yeah. yeah. And so instead of, instead of speaking to each other, they kind of describe the things they would say if they were actually speaking to each other. And it's just so clever. You sort of feel like, it's almost a, when you see something original in film, there's a feeling of deja vu because you feel that you should have seen it before. And why am I only seeing it now? Huh, you know what I mean? Uh, and that's the feeling I had when I watched that scene and other scenes. I will say it's very uneven. There were times it lost my interest for a while, but then my interest would come back. Like there's, there's again, there's so much to unpack and I know I'm just, <laughs> I know I'm supposed to give my quick uh, impression. So maybe I'll just leave it at that for this moment and, and throw it back to you. But yes, I enjoyed it. It's the most fun Soderbergh movie since his first one. Wow. Well, I, you know what, that kind of cushions what I'm about to say. I thought we were going into really hot take territory because I was, I'm going to say this is the most Soderberghian movie that Soderbergh has made, even more so than Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And I like Schizopolis better. I do think that's a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely did not like it better than Sex, Lies, and Videotape. But it's, it's, it's a fascinating entertaining film. And so I certainly can't begrudge you that opinion, even though it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily so few people have seen it. So there's not many to disagree, <laughs> um, but you know, <sighs> I think most people are going to be team Kier on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, in the, in the, if you throw down the gauntlet between sex lies and videotape and Schizopolis, I'm imagining my size fairly lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Fair but, enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but the thing is, I, I maybe, Maybe I don't really love it for the movie. I, I do love the movie because I'm just that kind of weirdo type of guy where I'm like, hey, I will love an ambitious failure more than I'll love a boring success. Like underneath is like kind of just lays there, you mm -hmm. know, and it's just like, here's this noir. It's, you know, it's fine. We talked about it in a previous episode and, you know, nothing really happens. It never takes off. But then you have Schizopolis that's like so wild and crazy. Like I think of like Richard Kelly's Southland Tales, which is a dumpster fire <laughs> but i love it i love it it's he's just trying to do all this crazy stuff and i love i'm just fascinated with the attempt you know and i see the attempt in schizopolis and it's just more importantly though this is the first movie even with sex lies where where soderbergh seems to be having fun and he seems to be playing yes you know like Everything else has been very, you know, whether it's a studio, you know, glossy studio of King of the Hill or, uh, you know, this kind of turgid, you know, noir of uh, underneath, you know, this is the first movie that he's playing. And, 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 you know, he's a guy, his favorite movies are Jaws and All the President's Men, you know, not rules of the game. He's not that yeah. like very esoteric capital A art house movie maker and his his previous three movies not sex lies i think sex lies is still fun and funny and I, and I and i still do love it but like those three he made before this are are really stiff they're just stiff movies and it, it just they don't feel like soderbergh movies to me and, and knowing how soderbergh values the necessity of failure like he needed those movies you know he needed them to be what they were he needed them to fail um, but he needed also to go back to the necessity of like, screw it, I'm just going to go make a movie. And there's a fascinating thing that that he said in uh, this interview with Independent Film and Video Monthly. He calls Gasopolis his second first film. And yeah. it really is. It feels like a student film almost. I mean, it was made for $250,000 over 10 months with a crew of five. All of them were his friends. Uh, he threw himself into the Reed role or 
dual roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Not um, only is he act once, he's going to throw himself that actorly challenge of playing, you know, twins or a doppelganger. <laughs> something. I don't I don't know. Uh, and and to hear him in the commentary, by the way, talk about his decision to play a dentist. Uh, and by the way, the commentary is he is interviewing yeah. himself <laughs> another legendary commentary track yeah i mean this guy i mean there's just nothing he won't do and he's he's very low-key about it. it's not you know he just goes and has very candid uh, on we mentioned the underneath a very candid interview uh he goes in schizopolis and does a interviewing himself which is so true to the movie i will say that i was listening to that interview of himself on that track and i forgot I, at some point I was like brainwashed into his weird world where I kind of forgot he was interviewing himself and I started to kind of like accept it as an interview because he was doing such a hilarious job of playing <laughs> off himself yeah. and like saying, well, where were you going with that? I don't remember, you know, like it was, it almost came across like a real interview. It was bananas. Yeah. I mean, it's better than certain interviews with may involve Neil LeBute. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Yes, one of the less pleasing commentary tracks of all time on Sex yeah, Lives and Videotape. Uh, talk about a missed, you know, such a great movie that got such a not not great commentary. But, you know, the funny thing is, is that like, you know, you read the reviews, which there's not many. There's not much chatter about this movie, but, the, you know, it's kind of called unconventional, experimental or, you know, uh, impenetrable. And some of those things are true. It is is unconventional. I don't know if it's impenetrable, though. I find it really personal like i feel like it's the most personal movie he's made i think it's yeah impenetrable is the wrong word because it is penetrable however it requires some effort uh, which is something that i would say most people don't hold against a lot of art film or you know literary novels or whatever that, that's held up often as, as a feature not a bug yeah and um so this is a film that does require a little bit of study a little bit of rewatching because you do learn how personal it was and you i mean Talk about personal. He cast his wife and daughter as his wife and daughter. But yeah. So, so there's that <laughs> level of things you can learn about his personal life. But it also is like the storylines, well, very slapdash and kind of hard to follow at times, do kind of cohere in different ways to make their own kind of sense. And there are, you know, there's a payoff at the end. It's not, uh, yeah, it's not impenetrable. Well, well, I want to talk about the the personal aspect of this because, yeah, I mean, uh, Bessie Brantley is his ex wife uh, who who was cast in uh, as his wife <laughs> and lover and whatever else. I don't know. Yeah, yeah actually, we should set that up very briefly since most people won't have seen this. She she plays the wife of Fletcher Munson, and he follows her. Oh, actually, no, he that's. I'm going to get this wrong. He discovers or we discover that she's having an affair with his doppelganger, the dentist, Dr. Jeffrey Korchek, who then dumps her for another version of her. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, there's some layers that yeah, Soderbergh's so, working out. It, it, so she leaves him and takes up with him. And then anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it's something I love this quote from David Kep. you know, he's writer of many movies, you know, Jurassic Park, et cetera, who said it's a decision that John Cassavetes wouldn't even make, <laughs> <laughs> which is like, if you're, if you've gone cast past Cassavetes and how much you're mining your personal life, you're in a very, very unique space. Uncharted territory. <laughs> so I mean, what do you think? I mean, what, what did you take of that personal layer or layers to that the movie has, despite being so slapdash and Monty Python-ish? Well, I think it's very, yeah, Monty Python's good. I thought of, you know, everything from Benny Hill to Upright Citizens Brigade watching, watching that kind of episodic zaniness of it. But the, the personal aspect, I think it ultimately turns what could have been an off-putting, alienating art, artsy film, which some people will undoubtedly respond to it in that way. But I think it makes it ultimately very touching and, you know, pathetic, not in the sense of like, you know, that people usually use that word, but like there's, there's this, there's this sense of like, it's, it's like, he's really working stuff out that scene where he comes home and he's talking to his wife, you know, in this kind of formalized way, really you read that into a relationship, like people who don't know how to actually communicate using the real words they're, they're meant to use. I mean, that's, that's artistically devastating. And then add that, Add to that fact, Betsy Brantley said that she 
wanted to do this movie with him because she wanted to kind of see if he behaved differently, um, you know, when he was with other people and also in, a, in an environment where he couldn't run away. Yeah. And I heard they fought a lot on set as well. Yeah. <laughs> so because yeah. he, she said because he had nowhere else to go. Yeah. <laughs> so she had him basically cornered. Yeah. And luckily it was a small crew. Thank God. That yeah. Did. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Of, of like largely friends. And, and he said that he wasn't making it to kind of see if there was anything still there, but it was more like just kind of, I don't know. I don't think he used the word closure, but it felt like he was almost trying to artistically, he was looking for artistic rebirth and almost to, to close the book on that relationship at the same time. It's crazy. It's laden with so many things. And yet the movie itself is very lighthearted. Yeah. It's very buoyant and silly at times. Um, you, there's so much stuff that's not tied. To, I mean, I wouldn't want to give anybody the impression that it is like it's going to read as this emotionally introspective film because it doesn't. <laughs> it, again, that re, it rewards your inspection right. of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's just it just goes to show like how how many layers there are to the movie because, like you said, like you watch it. There's a scene. You know, there's a scene where. Um, the, the the dentist version of Steven Soderbergh <laughs> sees Bessie Brantley, the, the like the third version of her for the first time in the office. And he does this weird double take. It's almost like you're waiting for if he was wearing a bow tie, the bow tie would be spinning, you know, yeah, 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 like, yeah. his <laughs> eyes would be going out in springs. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like so it has that. But at the same time, like you said, if you know this stuff, it's so much re rewarding. And then if you think about like, you know. It's not just a game that he's playing. Like you mentioned the use of, of language, like, and we talked about like that scene, which is, if you know that relationship between him and Bessie Brantley and their divorce and all this kind of thing, it's really painful. Like this idea that you can't communicate and like, you know, there's this thing that's going through about the failure of language or the banality of language, whatever you want to say. And you kind of can see Schizopolis as the work of an artist and, and kind of as and a, a man as well, who just, doesn't know what to do anymore. You know, like he, he, you look at this trajectory, like we've talked about before, like he made a black and white art house meta biopic that mm -hmm. bombed. He made a prestige movie that bombed. Then he made a studio thriller reuniting with the star of his landmark success that bombed. There's so, there's just not anything going right for this guy. He's getting divorced. I mean, you know, I mean, one of the most fundamental ambitious of an artist and I think as a human being is to communicate, to be understood and to understand. And, and this is a guy whose communication, you know, his movies are just, they are not connecting, you know, they're not connecting critically. They're not connecting with audience. So looking at Schizopolis, like it shouldn't be a shock that he made a movie that, you know, at its core is about language's failure to connect, you know, not to mention imposter syndrome, you know, I mean, he's his own doppelganger in the film. And one of his jobs is writing speeches for an L. Ron Hubbard ass <laughs> guru fraud, you know, who's whose boss, by the way, his boss, uh, Munson's boss barks literal studio notes at him. That, that's not a joke. That's that's like the boss's dialogue are direct lifts from studio notes that Soderbergh had received over the years. Like you start looking at these things and like, there are layers going on here. That is such an amazing detail that I did not know. And I love that. And, you know, related to that, again, that commentary track where he's interviewing himself. On one hand, it displays his sense of humor, but the the he's kind of playing himself as Soderbergh in the commentary track. And at for very long periods of it, he goes into this kind of like Hollywood blowhard mode where he, his self-regard seems absolutely endless. And he's talking about his talent and, you know, how, how people, I mean, it's funny because he'll say like, yeah, people have told me like my, my talent, it's almost like a smell. I think they <laughs> use the wrong word. I think they mean like an aroma, but yeah, but he, he's parodying the bloviating egotistical Hollywood director. And that I think ties in very much to some of his studio critique that he's slipping into the, the dialogue that he gives his boss in the movie. Like even in the commentary for the film, he's just getting so much off his chest about Hollywood. And as we know, he's ambivalent about Hollywood. He, he didn't want to commit to living there, you know, even before he made sex lies and videotape, he had been commuting back and forth, living in Baton Rouge and driving out there when he had work to do and then going home 
And then uh, after he could afford a nice place in LA after Sex, Lies, and Videotape, what does he do? He buys a farm in Virginia, you know, yeah. further, further away. Um, and kind of goes back and forth because he just is so reluctant to get wrapped up in the tentacles. Of right. Hollywood. It's not like he's from Virginia. <laughs> he's not. <laughs> he's not. He's not. Like, he had some childhood memories there. Yeah. No. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, you're spot on because like, look at even the character of uh, Elmo Oxygen. Who, <laughs> fascinating yeah. name. I uh, still haven't made sense of that. But like he abandons, basically abandons Schizopolis, the movie. Yes. And he goes, starts making, he get, ostensibly gets kind of plucked by studio executives of some sort, producers, whoever those two characters are. Yeah. And he goes to make movies that Soderbergh arguably should be making, like cop movies and thrillers and action movies. Like he gets stuck into the movie that like, Soderbergh's making a movie within the movie, the movies he should be making, you know, like, and it's like wild, man, wild. That is one of the other very funny parts of the film. And and again, like something that rewards learning a little bit about it. If you walked into that movie cold and you knew nothing about Steven Soderbergh, you yeah. would have walked out of that movie cold. And don't worry, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I love the, I love the Elmo oxygen stuff so much. Yeah. He, so he's this, he's this exterminator who goes into people's houses, rifles through them, takes pictures of his genitals in their houses. But meanwhile, he's being trailed by these, uh, yeah, this man and a woman who, who keep kind of like commenting on his performance as an exterminator. Like, wow, that's great stuff. That's great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then they basically lure him away and like, you, you should be in your own show. So he says, yeah, sure. Sounds great. So then he he leaves this his, that one storyline and then starts be, becoming this action movie star. And he's just hilariously low budge, <laughs> I don't know, skits, which again, I, I kept this is this predates Upright Citizens Brigade, the show, not the not this sketch comedy troupe, but. The energy and the wackiness and just the, the vibe of all of that made me feel like they must have been fans of this movie. Yeah. I, and I loved that show. That was such a great show. But it just and the way the, the storylines diverge and then reconnect and everything was very much UCB. Yeah. Um, but the Elmo Oxygen stuff is is very funny. And then, of course, he shows up for the big uh, assassination finale. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, <laughs> I think it's time for a break. But when we come back, if you think the, the movie is interesting and has layers, the making of it and what was going on additionally in Soderbergh's life, there's a lot there, too. This is a very fascinating time in, in Soderbergh's life. And we will get to that after a break. feel like stopping but I was a couple of things were going on you know I needed to I needed to transition out of a out of a, a trajectory that that I recognized as not being good for me creatively which was the I look at the first four films and I completely separate them out from everything you know that followed that that I made a very conscious decision to to um, resist what I saw as a kind of disturbing formalist trend in my work. I felt the films were getting worse because of this. Too much analysis, um, too, too hermetically sealed. They were becoming sort of lifeless to me. And so I made a very conscious effort to break out of that. Doing the book on Richard Lester was part of that process. And so Schizopolis, Grey's Anatomy, you know, was kind of this attempt to blow things up a little bit. So Soderbergh made Schizopolis with his friends for a thrifty $250,000 in his hometown of Baton Rouge. He made it on his terms, his way. But it didn't really go as planned, did it? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I mean, you know, Around the time of Schizopolis, uh, you know, as we talked about in the underneath, and it's going to extend into this, like Soderbergh's really not in a great place. I was reading through his interviews and in journal at the time. It, it, this is a journal that's taken from his book, Getting Away With It, which um, it's a series of interviews he did with Richard Lester, um, who's who's definitely an influence, as you said, on Schizopolis. In between the interviews, some of his um, some of his journals uh, of that, you know, of that year, 95 or whatever it is. And it's. It's clear that Schizopolis didn't give them results he was looking for, you know, not 
immediately at least. You know, like I said, you know, Schizopolis ultimately is the movie that, in my opinion, he needed more than any other. But what he gained from it doesn't really bear fruit for some time. So you have his career at this point. You know, he's struggling. There's a lot of failure surrounding him personally and professionally, which we talked about. And we'll get more in professional stuff at the time. But, you know, right now, while he's making this movie, you know, raising his own money and, and employing, you know, employing his friends. And he'll joke that employing in the loose sense because <laughs> no one got paid. <laughs> but... Um, you know, the only paid work he had was screenwriting and, and the results of though that stuff was unsatisfying, you could say. I mean, he's just he's running into one bad situation after another, um, though it's funny because this nightmare that he's having of, of all these, you know, screenwriting jobs not pay, taking place. I mean, it's. For us, for writers, it's like, that's just another day at the office. You know? <laughs> I guess it depends on how high you set the bar. Yeah. 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 To me, I feel like if I take a job that I, for which I get paid, well, <laughs> right. at least I got paid. That's true. Um, he's definitely, he's getting paid to do stuff that's not very satisfying to him, which he finds to be a big disappointment. Yeah. And I can I can list. So I'll get into what these were, these screenwriting gigs that he had, because they're fascinating. It's a fascinating look uh, of things that could have been his first one. Uh, he was rewriting a movie called Night Watch, that, which a movie that got made. I remember that. Yeah. I, I I didn't see it. I don't think a lot of people did. I did see it. Oh, wow. OK. Is that you, you McGregor? It was just me. Yeah. <laughs> me and Ewan McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> we saw it. <laughs> yeah, he definitely saw it. Soderbergh did because he I read some interviews where he talks about it like he won't talk directly about it, but it's it's pretty clear he's not crazy about the movie. You know, he he talked about some of the decisions the director made that he it's obvious he didn't agree with the stuff in the script that he's like, why did he change that? Or why did he have it was weird. He'd be like, why did he change that? And then he's like, why didn't he change this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I think that was the first. Yeah, that is the first movie that he wrote that he didn't direct. Fascinating. It's, yeah, because, yeah, everything else. And this done. is a period when he was starting to realize that maybe he wasn't a writer, at least of his own films. Yeah. And yeah, it, it gets um, it get really concretizes through <laughs> through this process, because um, after that comes and I couldn't believe this. This fascinates me to no end. Uh, Mimic, another uh, rewriting job. And it goes terribly. But. This is a collaboration. I, I just I, I've struggled to like wrap my head around this because I'm such a fan of two. Uh, these are two of my this is like the Mount Rushmore of directors for me. He was rewriting a Guillermo del Toro movie <laughs> like <laughs> what <laughs> what Kira, like what what is that collaboration over the years look like had that not gone so absolutely terribly? <laughs> I think we'd be looking at a series of just gorgeously designed films about monsters who come back to the nest to try to rectify past mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I want that movie. <laughs> the monster comes home to, to Dr. Frankenstein and they work things out. <laughs> they, they've been that. out in the world causing havoc, but you know, there's some unfinished business at home. <laughs> yes. They didn't leave things on good term with the brood. <laughs> <laughs> takes notes for next screenplay okay <laughs> but you know so the, the he doesn't even get credited for mimic you know it goes so poorly like del toro uses you know the wga has guidelines and like you have to actually use so much of somebody's draft to get credit and, and del toro used so little that soberg doesn't even get credited and he admits you know he wasn't focused on it you know because he was in the middle of uh, post-production on Schizopolis, and he's trying to sell it. He was also working on um, Grey's Anatomy, which we'll discuss next episode, because that's kind of running on parallel tracks. But he admits he was procrastinating. He didn't do his best work, and Del Toro kind of tossed it. It's also hard to know what he would have connected with in that movie. I don't know. Yeah. And it's a movie, it's, it's funny because it's, even Del Toro will say that's a movie that's plagued with script issues. Like yeah. he kind of has disowned it. He got it got taken away from him. The cut got taken away from him. But 
yeah, that seems a project adrift in a few ways, but what was Soderbergh doing there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's hard to imagine anyone involved in that uh, saying, okay, we're running into some problems here. Who, who can we get to solve this? Get me Soderbergh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like based on what? <laughs> yeah, it's like Transformers 5. We need Soderbergh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he was like the, the guy at the time because he had done some stuff even before this and he was producing some stuff. He was producing some interesting projects projects he was doing day trippers at the time that he just i think he was the guy who can do a lot of stuff that he was considered to be and he discovered that himself that he's not you know and um, that was part of his learning process because believe it or not there's actually more <laughs> that he was working on and this is another fascinating one yeah he wrote an adaptation of john Kennedy tools a confederacy of dunces which I never saw obviously that movie's never seen the light of day. It never that's was. one of those legendary un, unmade films, of course. Yeah. You could do a podcast just about that. Yeah. But it ended up in some sort of like legal hell with Paramount and you know, it killed uh any chances of that getting made, uh, which is unfortunate because you know, after seeing Schizopolis and that type of humor, like and it takes place in Louisiana, like that's a project he actually is a fit for. I agree. I would be fascinated to see his his version of that. Yeah, I would love to see it. I, I mean yeah, too bad. I mean, here's another wild one that I, I'm su surprised by. Um, he, I just love this title. Steven Silver presents Toots and the Upside Down <laughs> House. <laughs> um, uh, it's a child uh, children's fantasy novel, which uh, uh, admittedly, it's one I'm not familiar with, despite I feel like reading so many with my own kids. I write children's books and I've never heard of it. <laughs> no, that's a, it's a weird one. And I looked it up. You know, I went, of course, to, to Amazon to get a sense of it. And it's not like, it's not, I don't even know if it's in print at this point, weirdly. Um, but he was doing it for Henry Selick, who had just come off directing James and the Giant Peach. Uh, he'd done Nightmare Before Christmas before that. And no, Tim Burton did not direct Nightmare Before <laughs> Christmas, <laughs> despite what everybody seems to believe. But it would have been a stop motion animated movie, but it, you know, like these other things, never got off the ground. I mean, so it's so weird. Like, yeah, Mimic, Confederacy of Dunces, upside, Toots in the Upside Down House. None of these, it, like his previous three movies, seemingly none of these movies connect, but they're just gigs and he's taking gigs. And we'll talk a little bit later what he discovers through this process. But, you know, lots of iron in the fire, but nothing's happening with any of them. But isn't that kind of like the writing life, wouldn't you say? That is. I think it's more so than most people know. I mean, at least if you're a... If you're a, a a working professional. I mean, there are obviously, you know, speaking as a novelist, there are different kinds of novelists. There are the novelists who write only that which is personal to them. They write it. They take as long as it need, they need to take. Then they go out and try to sell it. And those people have other jobs, like 99 out of 100 of them do, because they don't make enough money from those books to, to live on. If you are, you know, we as we record this podcast, we're sitting in, in my office downtown in, in Michigan Avenue in Chicago. Lovely office. Thank you so much. I <laughs> love coming here to work every day, but I pay rent as a writer. I'm not writing on my couch like some, some people do. And so I have expenses. You know, we all have expenses. But basically, if you're going to be a working professional, you are looking for gigs. You're always looking for gigs. Clearly Soderbergh's looking, I mean, his ability, looking back at his career, uh, the, the number of things he accomplished, and then this huge list of things he kind of accomplished that you don't know him for because he pro executive produced it or something. Yeah. And then this whole list of unmade things. I mean, it's mind boggling, but back to my original point, I think probably the the person who maybe knows me through like one or two of the books that I've done would be shocked to realize how much crap I did in the actual in the last year to just actually you know make money <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah I mean and I think that's part of like the disconnect um between Soderbergh the director and Soderbergh the writer and I don't want to speak too much for him but like when you're a director Let's say you have a movie that doesn't get off the ground and and granted, you do a lot of development work and, and you know, pre-production, all this kind of stuff. And if it falls apart before cameras roll, you've done a fair share of work. You've done some work. But if you're a writer, you've brought it to completion for you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like so he has this different things like, yeah, I'm going to do development stuff and pre-production. I, I don't know, like how deeply he got into quiz show, like pre-production or even development. 
Uh, and then that got taken away from him, as we as we've said before. But it's such a different feeling to be like, I finished the script and for X, Y and Z reasons, you know, legal hell, you know, getting rejected by whomever hired you to do it. That's a different feeling when you're in development, you know, there's a chance that it won't work out. And I'm sure he knew these screenplays, there's a chance they wouldn't get produced, that they wouldn't yeah. actually be filmed. But you still, that's the thing as a writer, you still have to do the job completely. You can't turn in an outline. You can't turn in, develop. here's my <laughs> development work on it. Like, <clears throat> you have to write the whole thing. Yeah. And I think that's something that probably played into the hardship of that, that feeling that he's experienced. Like, wait, this thing is just gone it's not gonna get made it's i put in all this work it's done the script is complete and and that's a, that's is a tough pill to swallow especially on these are higher profile things they're like th seemingly three strikes in a row that's tough yeah yeah absolutely yeah and on the topic of mimic one of uh Soberg's friends told him this great line um i forget the friend's name but uh, Soderbergh was reeling after Mimic's screenplay basically being rejected. I mean, he still got paid for it, but it, he knew it was not going to get used. And the line that his friend said was, Stephen, don't fall in love with the John. Just take your money off the dresser and leave. <laughs> <laughs> Which I never know if I've, I've heard the writing mm. life uh, described so perfectly. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but we're going to get into <laughs> more of uh, Schizopolis after a break. We're going to talk about um, how it was received upon finally finding a home. And I'm going to go on a limb and most people can guess how, how it was received. <laughs> You won't need to look too far into the future. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, young and old, this may seem an unusual procedure speaking to you before the picture begins, but we have an unusual subject. Turn. When I say that this is the most important motion picture you will ever attend, my motivation is not financial gain, but a firm belief that the delicate fabric that holds all of us together will be ripped apart unless every man, woman, and child in this country sees this film and pays full ticket price, not some bargain matinee cut rate deal. Turn. In the event that you find certain sequences or ideas confusing, please bear in mind that this is your fault, not ours. You will need to see the picture again and again until you understand everything. Turn. I guess you can say that, weirdly, Schizopolis was Soderbergh's smallest swing, but somehow his biggest miss? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways it was. I mean, for starters, he barely even managed to sell the finished movie, which is like, talk about a, a, a night and day from not that long ago where he was like, you know, fighting people off with a stick for Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Yeah. And speaking of Sex, Lies, and Videotape, it premiered at Ken uh, at a surprise screening and um, surprise indeed. Surprise! <laughs> I mean, it was slotted at like a Friday morning special bot which i can't imagine is like prime real estate screening so no whoever saw the movie uh, uh you know who does the uh programming or whatever I, i'm not i'm sure this wasn't there by accident in that spot but um and they were right because there was like some warm responses i don't want to make it seem like um this was an utter critical failure because it wasn't they got some good reviews but at at can um there was supposedly there was a report that uh, uh 50 people walked out on the movie you sure. know uh it, it, like in early goings you know it's it's like the ovation he got for sex lies and videotape was was probably longer than most people stayed for schizopolis <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Ouch. yeah i mean he couldn't sell it he couldn't get it distributed and there's just so much going on that we've talked about that he was he was frustrated and he had a buyer on the hook. Uh, I believe this is again from his journals. The buyer went unnamed, but uh, Soderbergh wrote uh, in his journal, there's no deal and there's no distributor for either film. Uh, the other film being Grey's Anatomy. 
And I sit here and think I'm making films nobody wants to see and finding it impossible to write, even though it's my only source of income. What's bugging me, I think, is the possibility that this road that I've been encouraging myself to follow the last year and a half leads to nowhere, or perhaps somewhere worse than the place that I left. But what's the alternative? Go back and make stupid Hollywood movies? Starring Elmo T. Oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately that, that kind of is, minus the stupid part. But, um, <laughs> you know, he did sell the movie to Northern Arts uh, and it had a very limited release earning. And I don't know what the, you maybe you can do the, I know you love the percentages. <laughs> oh. It made about 10 grand on a $250,000 budget. That should be easy given all those zeros, but I still have to get out the calculator here because I'm just, that's how bad my math is. So I, I, if I remember correctly, while you're doing the math, underneath made back 8% of its budget. I don't know where this is going to sit. Where this we, where made we? back 4% Oof. of its $250,000 budget. So yet again, like the underneath, it lost less actual money, less total money, but as a percentage, this is now his biggest percentage failure in terms of investment and return. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, the fact is less people are seeing his movies, which yeah. is bad, which I mean, is really $10, bad. Ten thousand dollars at the box office. Yeah, I mean, it had to it just had to play nowhere. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's that's kind of I mean, it, the release had to been. I would be curious to know if it played in this very building where we are sitting because we're in the Fine Arts Building in Chicago at around that time. It was the Sony Fine Arts. It was a multi-screen movie theater that they had um, carved out of the uh, the Studebaker Theater, which has now been restored to its former glory and is, is a live stage theater. But when I moved to Chicago, they were showing art films down there. Oh, and wow. that's exactly the kind of film that if it played for one weekend in Chicago, that is probably the place it would have played. And in fact, I will I could look that up. We could look for the opening weekend and we could look at the old Tribune archives. Wow, I'm fascinated to know. Yeah, I mean, that I would say, you know, at best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to see the receipts, too, because they're, they're yeah. just, you can probably fit them in one hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's almost like to add insult and injury. We talked about this a little before in 95, what was going on in the indie scene that he basically created or was instrumental in creating in the very least. It's flourishing, you know. Uh, here's a list of some movies in 1996, indie movies that get released. Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man, uh, Mike Lee's Secret and Lies, John Sayles' Lone Star. Ooh, love that. Yeah, so good. Oh, God. Uh, Wes Anderson's Bottle Rocket, Danny Boyle's Train Spotting, which blew up, as we all know. And, of course, the Coen Brothers' Fargo. What a murderer's row of films. That's <sighs> yeah, I and mean, that's that's spectacular. And that's not. And there's even more uh, that I didn't include. Just a again, ninety five was a great year. Ninety six is another good year. And while that is all going up and the trajectory is go, you know, going, you know, on on a very steady climb, as we just said, Soderbergh's going hard in the other direction. You know, less people seeing his movies, less money, less ability to make. To make his movies, you know, Kier, what's what's going on, man? <laughs> like, what's the bright light that we can glean from this? Yeah, it's such a such a fascinating moment for Soderbergh. I mean, I, I think that I, I wish I knew, and I, maybe you do from from his his diaries, like just the the mood on the set of Schizopolis because it sounds like there are a lot of arguments with his wife, but at the same time, he's got the, the liberating feeling of running around his hometown with a camera and a bunch of his buddies. Like surely there was some, at least some kind of personal pleasure in reconnecting, you know, speaking of somebody who's run around my hometown with a camera and a bunch of my buddies, you know, like I know that like those are some of the happiest days of my life. Yeah. Um, so hopefully he was at least having some, some personal pleasure in that moment, but yeah, as, as uh, career wise, you can see the, like that that dark note uh, from the journal that you just read, like when he s steps back to look at the big picture, even though he knows he's kind of having this necessary reset to his artistic career, like that can't have been like it can't have felt like a sure thing. Yeah, I mean, he he obviously, you know, he goes like we said, this is his second first film and he really goes back to basics and. He had to, it feels like he had to exercise 
both his professional demons and his personal demons. And he just had to get it all, get it all out and burn it all down, you know, just kind of get that closure. You know, maybe this helped him get closure with his divorce. Maybe it helped him get closure to like figuring out how he wants to make movies, you know, because, you know, you look at, you look at uh, Kafka and you look at King of the Hill and you look at the underneath it feels like there's him trying to be three different directors. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's the arty mm-hmm. director, there's the studio director, and then there's the genre director. Mm-hmm. And he's none of them, but also all of them. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't found a way to fuse them in one movie. Right, right. And he hadn't figured out how to make the movie, like in the production side. You know, like Schizopolis, you know, we mentioned, you know, the budget was 250000 right? But he also, like, part of that was stripping it down he talks about how like i don't need this person standing around and i don't need that person standing around i don't think he's trying to union bust or anything like that (laughs) you know like he just he just knows how he needs to work and be comfortable and he needs more control like this is the first movie that he was the the dp on Mm -hmm. um something Mm -hmm. that he he now has become common i think he does all of his movies if i'm not mistaken um at least most Uh, he he just figure out how to be lean, mean, and faster, and it, it engendered more creative creativity. Like you said, you wonder how the making of it was. And from what I glean, like, yeah, there was the fighting with his wife and probably some true awkwardness within that for everybody else. It seemed like they had fun. They, they shot it over 10 months, so it's not like it was a rigorous everyday thing. I think they shot it when they could and when they had locations and whatever. And I get the feeling that they had a lot of fun, you know, and he had fun. Um, but you know, the actual work of making movies, which Mm -hmm. we said before, that is the reward for Soderbergh. Like he just loves the process of making movies. He started to do it his way, you know, small and fast and focused and cheap. And he'd eventually do this on all his movies, you know, big and small, like this is Mm -hmm. how he works now, you know, the control is such an interesting word here because it's like, you know, he is a control freak. But he's not a control freak in the way we typically think of a control freak, right? Like right. A, a, a Fincher, <laughs> right. to keep using him as the punching bag. But like, <laughs> but like you know, a, a control freak who you know we we tend to think of that term denotes somebody who is unpleasant, uh, unhappy, makes a miserable film set. Mm-hmm. He seems like kind of like he in time he will grow to become a happy control freak. And there was an anecdote and something I was reading. I can't remember what it was, but he was he was talking about making a movie um, with, for Scott Rudin, who's like a notorious uh, Hollywood producer, control freak. Oh, yeah. And, and saying, I don't remember which film was it. Do you remember? Um, I think it might have been Confederacy of Dunces that like that fell apart. Oh, maybe he, that was it. He was part of it, maybe, I believe. And And he said that, you know, ultimately, like he he can't work with a Scott Rudin because we're two control freaks. We can't. There's just, there's not, that's not going to work. Yeah. And so he's, you know, again, he's getting kind of awareness about how to pick projects, not just based on material, but like who you're collaborating with and like recognizing what he needs. So yeah, he's recognizing, you know, by stripping it down to a very small set and a small budget so he can truly exert control, he's able to, to control it in the way he wants. And like, then he can start to build back up from here. Yeah. And you said it, you know, you said it best, uh, I believe, in our previous episode, The Underneath, where you talked about how like his level of self-awareness, like he's able to reflect on criticism and not get defensive. And because of that, is able to grow and gain more awareness of who he is and what he does. And I think this is another step of that. He's it's it's control, but it's also he understands the conditions in which he needs to work to be happy. Yeah. You know, and it, and it shows like he needs to make a schizopolis every few years, uh-huh. you know, and he still yeah. he, he still <laughs> he, he, he has continued. to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he just he's learned to make it like, you know, smarter and a little bit better and stuff like that. But like, you know, he needs to every little bit, you know, it's we talk about. At first, we started talking about it's like the the sober one for you, one for me, and I think that's true. But I also think it's just an artistic like uh, w- w- catharsis or something that he's yeah. like, I gotta go away and make bubble. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back. In he's, it's like months, he's gotta you know? gotta like purge the you know 
big Hollywood thing out of his system or something. And so he can come back and do it again. Yeah. And he seems to, I mean, he, I think he enjoys those too. I don't think he's like being false by making an oceans 11. You know, I think he's still enjoying being a filmmaker. Oh yeah. I think I, I, Oh yeah. I absolutely think he loves making those movies. Like, especially, you know, oceans 12 when they get to go have a European <laughs> romp, you know, like, um, but I think I, I definitely think that he loves making those movies, but I think he, he just has this wonderful level of self-awareness. He knows what he has to do to make himself feel creatively satisfied. And he discovered, we talked about that before he discovered here. Okay. I'm not a writer. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe once in a while uh, he'll contribute to his scripts or do something that he'll shoot, but he's not a work for hire writer. He's not that guy. So I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to, you know, come to terms with my divorce and I'm going to, you know, he's kind of like shedding things, yeah, you yeah. know, along the way. And one of the interesting things about his kind of self critique is I, I feel like so often people who the artists I've met who are critical of their work in public or to in, or even in private, but sharing it with us is that um, it often sort of rings false because it's that kind of classic. A lot of people are self-deprecating, expect you to then say, no, no, it's great, Steve. (laughs) Steve, we loved the underneath. And there's zero sense of that in him. It just genuinely feels like it's this kind of radical honesty, which again is so fascinating. A guy who, who apparently couldn't, it's like he's so good at learning about himself and so self-analytical that it's crazy that you know, apparently his early relationships were just absolute failures because he couldn't express himself to the person he was in a relationship with. Like, go figure. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. So here's Skisopolis, right? Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, I love that. I love that. I love a, a minor detail on Soderbergh that he's not the guy who's like, oh, you know, what is your favorite work? He's like, well, actually, my favorite movie that I've made is uh, Kafka. It's like, no, he's like, no, that, that I, I don't like that movie that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's he he's not that director where you know those directors are like, well, actually, my least favorite, my least, you know, uh, watched movie is actually my favorite. Like, he's not that level of pretension. He's, like you said, a great word, radical honesty. You know what's so funny is, like, yeah, he's not the director who typically says, like, well, you know, you're the problem. Like, you didn't get it. It's not me. However, the framing device for Schizophilus, where he's he takes the mic yeah. in, in a theater and introduces the movie to to everybody, he he literally does sort of say, like, if you didn't understand this film, it's your fault, not mine. Yeah, a very, you know, Demillion uh, yeah. <laughs> flourish uh, uh, that was actually added in um, uh, after the movie was made because, like, people didn't get it. Right. So, so he doubled down. <laughs> so he doubled down. But it's still, again, tongue in cheek. He's like, yeah. <laughs> it, very tongue in cheek. And then he triples down with the commentary, which is, again, tongue in cheek. He's being facetious. He's oh, being, man. He's, How many tongues does this man have? A lot, I guess. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you just see the process personally, professionally, creatively. He just. Like I said, this is the most Soderberghian movie because he's letting himself be himself. You know, like you don't we don't see him get this autobiographical again, I would say, as he does in Schizopolis. But that playfulness and the irreverence of Schizopolis feels like him. Like it feels like his instincts are really starting to fire. Like in those instincts, we see, you know, pop up in Magic Mike and, and the informant, like certainly and, and Logan Lucky and so on. Like he finally started to synthesize these two elements of movie making, um, like the, the the production side and the artistic side, what he needs from both. And it's a big part of what will come to define Soderbergh's career. And luckily, he'd get a chance to use those instincts, which is not an opportunity afforded many directors after the run he went on. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so despite not wanting to make a, quote, stupid Hollywood movie, end quote, he would go on to do just that, well, minus the stupid part. And we will discuss that movie soon. We will. But for now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and take a moment to give us a good rating or review on your platform of choice. Even better... Tell a film-loving friend to join us on our journey to watch all the films of Steven Soderbergh. You can follow us on Instagram at The Filmographers or on X at Filmographer Pod. Special thanks to Kevin Lau, our producer, Gompson, who composed our theme music, and Cosmograph, who designed our logo. If you have feedback, suggestions, or just want to share a fun Soderbergh fact, email us at thefilmographerspodcast at gmail.com. Next time on the Filmographer's Podcast, we'll dig into Grey's Anatomy, 
which Kier tells me is on its 84th season on ABC. <laughs> it's true. <laughs>